That's the wrong one. Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Um, just a quick couple of announcements before we get started. Um, we have the spring evaluation for the um, for grand rounds that is going to be emailed out today. If somebody wants to fill it out by hand, there are a few copies outside, and it will be open through next Wednesday. So we have one more grand round um, that Dr. Sandoval will be speaking at next Monday, and then we will reconvene in September. So please fill out that the evaluations. We do use them in planning for each season, and um, really appreciate your input on that. Um, today, Dr. Saxena really wants to have an interactive uh, session. So from almost beginning with uh, being cases, I will have the microphone just like normal. So please let me get to you before you have any comments or questions. And with that, where's Dr. Hurl? Okay. Good morning, everyone. David Hurl. Oh, do, you need, do I need that? Okay. Yes, I need this. Uh, David Hurl. Um, so uh, does anyone out there know what a 605 is? I know. It's one of those questions you really can't answer. Good. We should the one who should know. So six or five. So my, my my kids are fascinated by the fact that the state of South Dakota um, has one area code for cell phones, landlines, for everything, for the entire state. Um, and so they've adopted the name that if you're from South Dakota, they call you a six oh five. Um, and it is it is kind of amazing to think about because knowing the culture of South Dakota. Uh, when you tell people your phone number, um, I know we've become so used to talking about your area code, but when somebody tells you your phone number in South Dakota, they just tell you the seven-digit number because the 605 is absolutely assumed. Um, so why do I talk about this? Well, it just happens that the speaker this morning and myself were both born in the state of South Dakota. Now, how, how many times have you found two people in a room that are actually from South Dakota? It's pretty rare despite the fact that we live next door. Um, but I grew up in Aberdeen, and Ritu was born in the unfortunate city of Brookings, South Dakota. Now, why do I say unfortunate? Grew, grew it's because up. Grew, that? Up. grew up, not born, grew born, up. Born, grew up. Uh, Brookings is home of the South Dakota hey. State Jackrabbits, and I happen to be a coyote from the University of South Dakota. Oh. Um, Ritu's education then took her to the University of Minnesota, from there uh, out to Portland, Oregon, and... Uh, and finally back to New Mexico, where she finished up her training and was on staff there for a few years before moving to the Twin Cities, North Memorial Hospital, and joining us here at Minneapolis Heart Institute a year ago. So Dr. Sexina is going to be speaking with us this morning about cardio a cardiology case carousel. And as Jolene already said, we're going to make it an interactive morning. So with that, Dr. Sexina. Thank you. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? So um, I actually was born in England. So I'm a, I'm a Brit by birth. So all sorts of interesting things. And I still remember my phone number from growing up because it's only seven digits. So, um, let's get started. Um, hopefully you guys uh, don't mind getting picked on so early in the morning. I was hoping to make this as interactive as um, possible. So I have a few cases. Let's see how many we get through. First one is a 50-year-old gentleman with a history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He was initially diagnosed at the age of 34, and he underwent myomectomy in 2000. He had an ICD implantation at that time as well. Continued to have ongoing issues with non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, and atrial fibrillation. So his past medical history is significant for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He had an echocardiogram last in July of 2016 with no evidence of an outflow tract gradient, normal um, LV function. Recurrent symptomatic non-sustained ventricular tachycardia treated with sotalol and renolazine. He'd had recurrent atrial fibrillation requiring four cardioversions prior to this current year, his last being in uh, June of 2016. So his family history, positive for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Social history, really unremarkable, no tobacco, no significant alcohol use. He's on uh, dabigatran. This is prior to our current admission that we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss the previous admission first. 
um, dabigatran, uh, sotalol, ranolazine, and rosuvastatin. So he presents prior to our current admission about two weeks, give or take, before uh, for cardioversion. So his last cardioversion was in June of 2016. He continued to have issues with sustained atrial fibrillation, which actually began January 5th, 2017, and he does not tolerate this very well. So he was set up for an elective cardioversion on January 18th. He was successfully cardioverted January 18th to sinus uh, to atrial paced rhythm, and subsequently had hypotension and diaphoresis. And this is taken from the notes. About 30 minutes after the cardioversion, he ate a sandwich very quickly, developed hypotension, diaphoresis, chest pressure, and felt to be vasovagal. However, his hypotension persisted. His systolic blood pressures were low into the 70s, not responsive to a 500 cc bolus of normal saline, not responsive to a 250 cc bolus of albumin. So his hypotension also didn't respond to phenylephrine. And then with this, he also developed coughing and bronchospasm. He was given duonab, um, vasopressin, and IV solumedrol. And he, of course, because I'm up here, and those of you who know me like, know I like echo, uh, had echoes performed on the day of cardioversion as well as the second day. Prior to this cardioversion, he had been ill. He had uh, had an upper respiratory infection and an upper airway issue, had actually been given steroids and antibiotics and albuterol before he presented for the cardioversion on the 18th. So this is his echocardiogram. And this is where I'm going to um, ask for volunteers first, kindly. And then if nobody volunteers, I'm going to pick on people. And since I only know a few names, there's only a few of you I'm actually going to end up picking on. I apologize. I'm going to keep moving. Matt, do you want to volunteer? There's a lot of them. So if you get this one out over the course, I won't pick on you again. Good. I always start with the first one. It's the easiest. Uh, it's a long view. The second one would have been easier. <laughs> um, there's color Doppler shown here. The LV function looks normal to me, probably put the F around 60 to 65. Um, there is a lot of mitral regurgitation. It's hard to quantitate in just one view. Um, it looks, from this apical four-chamber view, it looks like there's both a central component and then maybe part of the jet heads towards the septum too. And I think this is a five-chamber view showing yep. more mitral regurgitation. And it's just more mitral regurgitation. So thoughts, how would you grade BMR based on that limited evaluation? I would say it's at least moderate, but it might be more. So I would think about doing further evaluation with the TE or more pictures. So, so it was graded moderate to severe. He was stabilized over um, the day into the next day. He did get some fluid resuscitation. And then his blood pressures bounced back. He was diuresed a little bit. And the following day, he had this echo. Wait, do you want to? This one's easier than the last one. So he has asymmetric septal hypertrophy still. I think he said it was my Yep. Um, but no outflow, um, no, nothing that looks like is encroaching into the outflow. I mean, the anatomy of the valve looks normal. I don't see any flail signals on, on this one. Oh, okay. oh, there we go. Um, so I'm still seeing the mitral regurgitation we saw before. Kind of a complex jet. It's hard to tell what's the etiology. Preserved LV. Apical four. There's no LVOD obstruction, so it's not SAM related. The jet does not suggest SAM related. It's more anterior central jet rather than posterior. And I apologize for the hiccups in the video. It's the speed at which the computer works. Sometimes my brain. There's a close up. That's the last one. It's hard to tell again the etiology. It's probably in the moderate range what I'm yeah. seeing here, but definitely not related to SAM or. Uh, yep. So the valve leaflets weren't commented on anything being significantly abnormal with them. Absolutely right. There was no comment on SAM on that echo. It was graded moderate. 
At the bottom of the report, so you know how our reports have the technical impressions and then the final summary. At the bottom of the report, the numbers section, there was a comment saying that the ERLA was measured at 54, which for those of you who don't know effective regurgitant orifice area, that would actually be in the severe range, but this was thought to be a poor calculation. I just thought it was interesting going back, because this is not part of the case that I was involved with, that they had put that into the actual final summary of the echocardiogram. He did well. Um, from, the final, uh, from the final progress notes and the discharge of that admission, um, it, it was felt that his cough and chest pain worsened in the setting of hypotension, but improved as his blood pressure went up. His blood cultures and chest x-ray remained unremarkable. He was stabilized, and due to the fluid he was given for resuscitation, he was given a five-day course of Lasix upon discharge. The discharge summary gives his final diagnosis of hypotension, unclear etiology, and they actually questioned whether or not he'd had an allergic reaction to something during the cardioversion. What? We don't know, but it said question anaphylaxis. So due to his recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation on the Sotolol and the multiple cardioversions that he'd had scheduled, he was actually scheduled and set up for an outpatient atrial fibrillation ablation. He went back into atrial fibrillation about seven days prior to his scheduled pulmonary vein isolation, which was three days post that cardioversion discharge. He called two days prior to admission with lightheadedness, and then so he presented on January 30th at, um, as an outpatient for pulmonary vein isolation. He had elective atrial fibrillation and right atrial flutter ablation, which was performed uh, successfully. It was a complex atrial fibrillation ablation, but there was um, no issues with it, and he did well. So during the PACU stay, this was from the nurses in the PACU, <clears throat> his blood pressure dropped to 64 over 45 millimeters of mercury. He was given albumin and neosinephrine, and then his blood pressure went up to 144 over 91, had a funny feeling in his chest. His heart rates varied in atrial arrhythmia from the 150s to 160s, and then the nursing notes said there was a run of um, non-sustained VT into the 170s. I did not find those strips going backwards through time. Um, he subsequently converted, stabilized with his rhythm, just on his own, to an atrial paced rhythm. Heart rates were in the 75 range, and his blood pressure was 100 over 61, and so he was transferred to the floor to spend the night to be then electively discharged the next day. That evening, he went back into atrial fibrillation, felt poorly, was a little, uh, had a little chest discomfort with it. He got his evening dose of Sotolol a little bit early. An hour later, he converted and then remained in atrial pace for them, and he did well. So there were no notes between, say, 9 p.m. and the following morning. So the following morning is when I met him. Um, at 7 a.m., he awoke with shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness. His blood pressure was 70 over 40, and his heart rate was 75 beats per minute. A rapid response team and the on-call physician was called. His cardiac exam was regular. He did have a two out of six systolic murmur not unexpected. Um, lungs were clear and he had no edema. That was his morning EKG at the time of his rapid response. Um, Dr. Hurl, can you see it from where you are? I don't know if, the, if they display well, but they are. Is it, yeah, I can't tell. Is that uh, atrial pace spike there in V1? Yep. yep, he is back to his A pace, so this isn't an atrial sub anymore. Yeah, so it's, a, it's essentially a, a paced rhythm. It looks like AV sequentially paced rhythm. And, um, and the conduction enjoy, block yeah. is the conduction block is old. He is known to have a oh. prolonged conduction with his myomectomy. So not seeing any old EKGs, I can't make any real comparison to what's been present before. But that's essentially what you can make out of this EKG. So no, no arrhythmia issue. He wasn't an AFib, and then again, he'd had the prior conduction, uh, the prolonged um, QRS, and the changes that come with that previously. So nothing, nothing terribly acute. That was his chest X-ray, um, and I will tell you the formal read demonstrated no cardiopulmonary process. There was no acute cardiopulmonary process. You know, his angles are relatively clear. Maybe you'll hear fluffy, but not terribly exciting other than the projection. So his labs, um, this was again at time of presentation. These were that morning's labs. His sodium was 132. His um, potassium was 5.2. Bicarb was 18. Bion and creatinine was 17 and 1.15. Lactate level is 3.1. Um, his troponin is 3.48. His uh, CBC was unremarkable other than a little bit of thrombocytopenia at 134. And this is the day after his procedure. Yeah? Any of, the echoes, any of the echoes were done when he was hypotensive or these were all he was? The two that I just showed you, 
So the two that I showed you were from the prior admission. The one on the 18th was done after he'd been stabilized after the cardioversion, so his pressures were better. It's a very good question. You, you might as well just have answered my, my question. <laughs> well, the only thing so. is the dynamic condition, the LVOC obstruction. So whether we're missing it when he's feeling better, that would be there. Yeah, so, so uh, very, very nice, Said. You just asked and answered my question, but... Well, I'm surprised you didn't have an echo in the uh, PACU. Uh, somebody who has an atrial ablation, if the blood pressure drops, we don't give albumin, we get a set echo. Not not for the reasons you're looking at, for, you know, other reasons, you know, pericardial effusion yep. and so forth, so. And, uh, you know, again, I, I had taken care of him from this morning forward, from where I just started presenting with the STAT TTE. This is actually when I walked in the room when he was getting his uh, as Saeed nicely put out, STAT TE during his hypo, his, this hypotensive episode. I had not been a party to his care prior or in the January 18th when he had, you, you, I don't know if you walked in after that, he'd had the same presentation after a cardioversion um, on the 18th where he became hypotensive. So no, he'd not had an echo and so that was going to be what was the next thing that you order as he's getting teed up to go to the ICU. and and you answered the question, and so the uh, questions were set TTE, take him to the cath lab as a level one, inotropic supports or pressors such as neosinephrine or norepinephrine, uh, Dr. Al-Sadawi said a set TTE, so why don't, why don't you tell me what we see then? Say <laughs> Hopefully these play. Go ahead, can I move forward? Yeah, so it's, again, we're similar to what, similar to before. I mean, there's probably more SAM now we're seeing there might be some degree of LVOT obstruction here with color, so we'll see. Then M the MR looks more impressive now as uh, compared to before. Again, it doesn't see, I mean, it's a central jet more than posteriorly directed jet, so I still doubt that it's related to, okay. to Sam. And this is a parasternal long axis view. And, and there really isn't much in the way of uh, turbulent flow in the outflow. And I will tell you, I, I don't have the Doppler tracing because <coughs> I'm presenting the case, not the echo necessarily. But um, there was no significant outflow obstruction that was registered. I will also tell you that this MR had a nice triangular shave, shaped uh, curve. Um, so it's, a the, dynamic MR, it's a dynamic MR case. Uh, I mean, could be related to ischemia from left circumflex or RCA disease and papillary muscle dysfunction. You can see some dithering of the posterior leaflet. Uh, so it could be an ischemic MR that's just getting worse every time it's hypotensive. And, uh, but no, no debate, very severe mitral regurgitation with these images. Um, okay. So he's now in the ICU. And what would you do? Um, take him to the cath lab, so ischemic MR, it crossed my mind. Start him on pressor support. His blood pressure is systolic, it's still in the 70s. Uh, put in a swan and an art line, and then I'll just make things a little bit more dramatic. He becomes rapidly hypoxic. He's requiring five liters uh, by face mask. His stats are in the 90s on five liters. He's still having ongoing chest pain, shortness of breath. So Matt, I know that you hang out in the ICU. Um, I, I know what you would do, so I'll just let you answer. <laughs> well, I think if you had a, I, I would be tempted to put a swan in because if you had a swan in, you could uh, examine more acutely for rapid change in, in his hemodynamics. I too was tempted to put a swan in, and he really did not look well to transfer him. Um, and so, he, his EKG didn't show any acute ischemic changes, and with that echo and, and how hypotensive he was, we did go ahead and put in a swan and an line. And just, just for those of you who um, aren't used to seeing this, this, this is the PA tracing, this is the CVP tracing, this is the art line tracing. This is on a scale of 100. Um, should, we, should I pick on somebody else, or do you want to answer? Want to answer? Uh, Dr. Bradley? Any comments about the PA pressures? No, because I didn't follow what you meant by this is on a scale oh, of 100. This is, so this is the 50 mark right so there? And I this guess is my concern initially was based on the echo that you saw, that the reason that he's in flash pulmonary edema is because of the severe MR and elevated pulmonary artery pressure. So I guess I would have felt that I understood that regardless of the SWAN numbers based on those images. And 
So I would have been thinking about getting him on BiPAP or some non-invasive ventilation to try and help him and temporize him in terms of his hypoxemia, and then trying to figure out why he's got sudden uh, acute severe MR and, and ischemic etiology is what I was leaning towards. So I guess this confirms my thought that he's got very elevated pulmonary artery pressures. Yep. Very good. So we did. We confirmed his cardiac index was 1.22. His peer pressure was 72 over 36 with a mean of 48. Wedge was 36, and he was he was stabilized from a hypoxemia standpoint. Um, SVR is 15.50, PBR was 3.72, mixed venous O2 was 38. Um, what now? Coronary angiogram to look for ischemia, uh, balloon pump, pressors, inotrope. 70 still. All of the above. I mean, I think you're still going to need an angiogram with probably a balloon pump if it's still unstable with all, all of this hemodynamics. So he'd had prior coronary workup in his history and hadn't had coronary disease. So I went the route of having a balloon pump put in him, and then we actually started him on nitroprusside for um, after load reduction. And so this is his swan numbers after his balloon pump and his nitroprusside was started. Um, and then, again, this is a 50 scale now for his PA pressures. And you can see his PA pressures dropped to 36 over 22, his uh, mean dropped to 27, and his CVP was 19, dropped to 12. And this is just with one of nipride and a balloon pump. And so this was his swan number trend. Um, 72 over 36 uh, for his PA pressures with a mean of 48. The wedge was 36, and his index was 1.2. This was after we started the balloon pump and the nipride, and his cardiac index went to 2.45. PA pressures dropped nicely, 36 to 22. PA mean was 27. Wedge was 22. Um, his SVR decreased from 1550 to 900, and he, he stabilized. And so um, his chest pain and shortness of breath went away completely. Um, his hemodynamics improved. And while we were sitting there, this was the same day, the afternoon after the dust had settled, we sat down and we talked. He said he had had no fevers, chills, no cough. He'd not had the chest pain um, so much as he'd had these episodes where he'd get really lightheaded, shorter breath, and dizziness leading into these episodes. So he'd had these same episodes over the past six months. He'd had them with increasing frequency, and he'd noted them with vagal maneuvers, i.e. going to the bathroom, uh, when he felt he was in atrial fibrillation, although he says he also felt them when he was not in atrial fibrillation, and then with exercise. He actually told me he really wasn't doing much in the way of activity because he'd been living fearfully for these, uh, this process to continue to recur. And he described his symptoms very similar. He said, this is exactly what happens to me, just like it happened to me this morning. So we, of course, because I'm an echo person, decided to reevaluate his mitral valve with the balloon pump and the nipride. Um, so the, they did both a TEE and a TTE to look at that mitral valve. Say, can I pick on you again? Since you're the echo person in the front, that's not post call. <laughs> so definitely the MR looks better, maybe in the mild range now, if anything. So they did one, they did a couple trans thoracic pictures, and then there's the TEE images. So there's probably mild to moderate AI as well. Mm -hmm. And the this MR. is at one to one, by the way, on the balloon. And the MR is probably in the mild, mild to moderate range. I thought mild to moderate. So there's the leaflet. And that's actually why I'm showing this. So this is on the balloon pump at 1 to 1 or 1 to 2 and nipride. I can give you some more. I don't see anything wrong here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really not an exciting valve, is it? I, in the heat of the matter, so I remember saying to myself, oh, I think there's some posterior tethering there. However, at the, that's what I said at the time. When I re-looked at this, when I played through these images several times getting ready to pre present it, I was much less impressed than I was the day of. He's got a little bit of prolapse, um, which I'll show you in a second. The MR is really not terribly exciting with the balloon pump in, and there's the valve. So posterior, for those of you who aren't used to looking at 3D uh, mitral valves, that's the posterior leaflet, the anterior leaflet, aortic valves there for um, um, to know where you are. So again, a little bit of prolapse. There was nothing flail. The posterior leaflet may be a hair tethered, but looking at it in the retrospective scope, I was less impressed by it. Saeed, any comments? It doesn't look so impressive because we get more. 
Yeah, not to cause what had happened with his dynamic AR. So he stabilized quite nicely. His symptoms were gone. He and and keep in mind in the background, I was talking to other people, but that's not how I'm presenting this case. Um, so he went back into atrial fibrillation the following day, um, and actually because of how much he didn't tolerate his atrial fibrillation on the Bolin pump and. With the nitroprusside, he was started on IV amiodarone because he was having paroxysms of atrial fibrillation. He was stabilized with one to two of the balloon pump, again, due to the increased aortic regurgitation with the one to one, we backed off on it. Diuresis with furosemide. And then his blood pressures were as following. He was 90 over 45. His rates up in with the AFib in and out were up to 107. His weight had decreased from 195 the day prior to 191. His PA pressures were 36 over 29 with a mean of 25. The wedge was 21. His cardiac index was 2.42, and his SBR was 964. He was on nitro. This was on nitroprusside 0.7 uh, balloon pump of 1 to 2, and then the heparin drip for his AFib. With weaning of his balloon pump, trying to keep his cardiac index greater than 2, his blood pressure decreased and his symptoms would increase. So. I know you guys still want a coronary angiogram, and I promise you will see one, but other than the coronary angiogram, what now? What do you do with that valve? Do you replace it or repair it? By the way, I kept wanting a coronary angiogram, too, and my consultants of choice were like, we'll get there, we'll get there. Uh, valve replacement, valve repair. Try to medically manage him with afterload reduction. Hope that as the atria remodels from his pulmonary vein isolation, things get better, or a structural consult for a mitral clip. So I guess I'm impressed by the fact that the the pulmonary catheter did provide you a lot of guidance because it gave you the systemic vascular resistance that told you that he was clamped down to all get out, and that's why he was in flash pulmonary edema because he had that severe MR because he couldn't push it forward, and releasing that helped. But right, so the problem the is, is why did that happen, right. and why can't we kind of medically manage him now? So then I'm still left with I need to understand what's going on elsewhere. And and I will tell you, I I I lived this case. I've had this discussion with this case, and, and fortunately, my ringer is here too, who will help me hopefully explain why it happened. But, but, but at the in the heat of the moment, what would you do? Would you would you? I, I started going for, looking for the evidence I was asking for before to the try cap. and yeah, yeah to try and say all right, there's nothing else going on here mm -hmm. that's contributing to this other than the fact that he clamps down, and I need to understand what why. that's about. Yeah. So you would you would aim for a coronary angiogram now that he's stable? Anybody else? I, I actually contacted the valve folk. I, I contacted the structural valve people. This is all within a day, by the way. I contacted the structural valve people and CT surgery. So 20, less than 24 hours have elapsed since I met him. Um, you know, I felt that he had more than one episode, just like you had a severe dynamic MR, and he was having symptoms of it. He had had, and I didn't show this because I got echo heavy in my presentation, in July of 2016, he'd had a baseline echo that actually had shown moderate MR. Again, no, no structural issues, and this was just as an outpatient elective um, uh, echo with no outflow tract obstruction, no SAM, but just moderate underlying MR with an EF of 60 to 65. So surgery did see him, and he was felt too critically ill for CT surgery, and he was presented at valve conference, which just so happened to be that day. That worked wonderful how that worked out. And the consensus was reached to attempt a mitral valve clip after presentation. So, and again, he'd had a CT scan, and so the coronary artery issue wasn't as pressing of an issue, but I will tell you that every single moment of my time, I was like, man, I should just cap him. But he didn't have any dynamic EKG changes. He wasn't having, his symptoms completely resolved after his valve was allowed to move forward. No, uh, other than the myomectomy, he didn't. We did end up, I did end up having him cast during this um, mitral clip. Uh, but so he went ahead and had a mitral clip procedure. And um, I don't know if you want to comment, Dr. Siraj, or if you want me to go through this. I think it'd be great because I, say, I walked in a little late and uh, I, I don't remember all the details. Okay, I'll, so. I'll go through the clip and then and then you, you just have to talk about the physiology in a few minutes. <laughs> so his opening LA pressure was 17 um, with a systolic blood pressure of 95 on the balloon pump. With stoppage of the balloon pump, his LA pressure rose quickly over to over 20 millimeters of mercury, which is elevated. So they put a clip in in the medial location, which was thought to be satisfactory, um, improved with good leaflet insertion. However, upon release of the clip, there was a jet more medial that looked mild to moderate, and then there was a very severe jet lateral to the first clip that was the second target. They placed a clip in that area that was adequately treated, and then they discussed whether or not to proceed with treating the other jet that was more on the medial side. 
but his LA pressure was 16 even off the balloon pump for five um, minutes and his LA pressure then just remo remained 16 so they felt that it was good and they just left him with the two clips. So this also answered my question. I kept thinking about this too, um, Dr. Bradley. So this kept going through my head too. So that's his right coronary. And his coronaries were really unremarkable. I made Dr. Saraja uh, give me a coronary angiogram because I was worried about it as well as a cause for his dynamic MR because, again, all things being even, dynamic MR, we think of ischemia. So this is his first clip um, here and then the second clip being placed. And the echo images during the clip. Faith, can I pick on you again? Do you, do, do you not want to be picked on again? <laughs> you, you, sorry, there are other echo structural guys. <laughs> so it's hard. I mean, there's still probably some my them on. Um, it's hard to tell where it's coming from. So that's the first clip. No, that's the second clip going in, I think. And I, I had to show it because. In conference, you show the 3D pictures. So that's the clip going down, and that's the mitral valve again, the posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflet. Right, so you see it's in C2A2 position here. So there's a little bit of uh, still MR maybe coming a little bit medial to the, uh, to the clip here. Yeah. Maybe trace MR no more than that. And so they actually, they actually left. Um, the septal puncture open because, again, their concern was that he wouldn't be adequately treated by the clips. And so they left this open in case he needed to be re-intervened um, um, upon for that valve. What was the length of valve gradient after the clip? It was about four. And then I have one more echo because I, I don't think I've shown enough echo pictures yet of this particular person. So I have one more echo to show you that actually has the final numbers, and he's, he's remained about four. So the, uh, that's a good question. So um, Dr. Chu asked about the mean mitral gradient after the two clips place. So the following day, his LA pressure in the cath lab was 16 um, after the procedure. He remained on the balloon pump at 1 to 2 with the nitroprusside at 0.3. His PA pressure was then 38 over 22, his RA pressure was 18, cardiac index was 2.6, and his SVR stayed low at 8.55, so his balloon pump was removed. Two and a half hours after the balloon pump removal, PA pressure was 36 over 26, um, wedge pressure was 19, cardiac index was 3.53, RA pressure was 15, SVR was 641, uh, so quite quite lovely numbers, and that was just on the 0.3 of NIPRIDE. So the nitroprusside was weaned off, he was started on a little bit of metoprolol, continued on furosemide. His swan was removed, and then two days after his clip, which was now four days after I met him, he was transferred to telemetry. He was eventually transitioned to oral amiodarone. He did have a recurrence in his atrial fibrillation, required cardioversion again on February 7th, remained on Coumadin now, so his uh, anticoagulation had changed, amiodarone, and was actually discharged home in good condition. He was seen in follow-up in March of 2017, and I got a text from his electrophysiologist with the patient and his doctor with two thumbs up signs from March. I, I was going to display it, but then with the whole patient confidentiality thing, I thought it wasn't a good idea. Um, but he, he's been doing super remarkable, really, really well. And then he was seen by his primary cardiologist in the HCM clinic in April, and they had ordered a repeat echocardiogram. So just for the interest of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this one. So parasternal long axis view again, and you can see the, the clip right here. Overall heart function was read as normal. This is color Doppler across the mitral valve, really unremarkable in the amount of mitral regurgitation. LV function, mid apex chamber um, in the short axis looks nice and normal. Funny septum from his myomectomy and his bundle branch block, but overall EF was read as normal. You can see the clips there, and mild mitral regurgitation. Officially, it was read out as mild mitral regurgitation and a mean gradient of four. And that's as of a couple of weeks ago, about four weeks ago now. So, so he'd had several of these episodes for his dynamic mitral regurgitation. 
Um, you know, his valve with the balloon pump and nitro preside, as Dr. El Sadawi said, at most was mild to moderate. And really, nothing terribly wrong with that valve. There wasn't a lot of tethering. There wasn't a lot of uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet to have caused that regurgitation. Baseline, he did have moderate MR, and he has that underlying physiology of the HCM. So, you know, the hypothesis, my hypothesis was that whatever had happened in January after his cardioversion was very similar to what had happened and that these were his events. And so, you know, in the discussions I'd had with his electrophysiologist who was taking care of him that morning, um, the, the interventionalist, uh, who also happened to be the structural valve guy, was that fixing the valve or doing something with the valve was probably going to be really important to avoiding these episodes because the chances of him having recurrent atrial fibrillation were pretty darn high. He'd had a complex um, PVI, and he very well could have had more, and he did have more episodes of atrial fibrillation. The other thought was to ablate his AV node and make him pacemaker dependent, but again, my my thought process, my working hypothesis, and hopefully we'll get some more insight about my, my physiologic thought process behind this, was that it was the atrial compliance issues and the changes that happened with both the LA compliance and the pulmonary vein compliance that actually led to these dynamic episodes. So I, I, we did look this up. There was a Mayo case report of about 12 cases after surgical maze that showed an elevation of LA pressure, giant V waves after the surgical maze. But interestingly enough, those patients didn't have significant mitral regurgitation. And could he have had the same physiology with the background of that moderate MR then worsening his, um, his situation from causing the severe dynamic MR? Could it just be the decrease in LA compliance in the pulmonary veins? Um, is there true structural changes with the tethering that happens and some displacement of the papillary muscle that leads to the poor um, valve leaflet apposition and or prolapse? Um, and then I thought this was really interesting. So there's uh, some case reports of after AV nodal ablation because of actually the compliance changes to the left ventricle that you get giant V waves in the setting of elevation in LV EDP. So I was hoping Dr. Saraja would be here and hopefully he could make some comments. Oh, wait. Yes, there, Dr. Alpha, howdy. So, you know, I can imagine how changes in the compliance of the left atrium can change anything you know, backward, but I have, I have, you know, I don't, I can't see how a compliance in the left atrium can affect the mitral valve itself. That that doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, I also can understand why an AV node and a pacing can change because, first of all, you're inducing pacing components, which can cause dyssynchrony. You can change the compliance of the left ventricle, and that can affect the mitral valve. But just purely, um, you know, left atrial compliance should have no effect on the mitral valves short of long-term dilatation. So without a structural change in the mitral valve that can explain this or a dynamic change in the outflow tract, um, I don't know that the AFib would have, or the procedure would explain anything. And, and, I, and I so appreciate that comment because you actually completely voiced exactly what I believe I had said to Dr. Saraja. I'm like, explain this so to me I, I because what that's what they do. I think it was the uh, LI compliance issue and the drop in preload, which these HCM patients are very prone to. And the preload drop exacerbated the LV obstruction, which then causes dynamic MR. So he actually got into trouble, as these HCM patients can do when they have any alterations in their preload. And I, th I think that was what started it all. It, you're right, it's not the uh, PVI or left atrial ablation by itself, but it's that plus the dynamic obstruction from the Holcomb that he was prone to. Any other thoughts? I feel like we never saw dynamic obstruction, even in his worst setting where... No, and, and so, that's, so that's the other question. Um, so Dr. Bradley said, um, I, I, I feel like we didn't see any dynamic obstruction. And, and again, I don't think there was true the, the phenotypic SAM. But I think that there's probably some changes that occur because of his underlying HCM physiology, probably, that did lead that there is that one picture in the acute setting where the valve looked like it was not collapsing. And I, and I wonder if that's what you were commenting. I'm not an echo doctor, but you know, again, it looks, there is a dynamic posterior aspect uh, of the jet, and that's what we were going off of. I, I present it because I present things that I find fascinating, and I present things that still leave me 
scratching my head. So would you would you just see how he does? Would you fix the valve? What what would you guys do next? He's fifty. Any thoughts? Two thumbs up is two thumbs up. Well, I'm I'm a firm believer of let it be. He's actually doing really really well. I was so I was so impressed to get his text. Um, um, the the EP physician's text with him doing as as well as he was. He was doing great. So um, I have a quick show and tell, and it's a variation on a theme. I like to stick with themes. So this is not, and I apologize. This is a case that comes from another life. Um, my other life. So a uh, 67-year-old woman, uh, stuttering chest pain for one to two days, radiated to her jaw, shortness of breath, um, no PND, but a little bit of orthopnea, no prior history of anything. She's actually a very, very healthy 67-year-old woman. No prior surgeries other than having children. She'd had a C-section, mild hypertension, no known drug allergies, not a smoker, denies any significant alcohol use, Family history, no premature coronary artery disease or sudden cardiac death. She's on hydrochlorothiazide and lisinopril for her blood pressure. And so she was seen in the emergency room. By the time I had seen her, she, her chest pain was chest pain free. Her blood pressure was actually 138 over 76. Heart rate was 78. She was 97% on room air. No acute distress. Lungs were relatively clear, but you know, a couple of rare crackles in the bases kind of get better if you make them sit up or cough or take a deep breath. Um, cardiac exams, regular rhythm, she had a 3 out of 6 systolic murmur heard at her left sternal border, as well as an apical component murmur, no jugular venous distension, and she had a uh, trace hitting edema. Chest pain free, mind you, at this time. Pretty comfortable looking. Any, any takers on the EKG? Yeah. Yep. It's acute, I will tell you. She'd had a normal EKG before. Any other, want to change your apical hypertrophy to a different diagnosis? Sorry? Somebody said it. Yeah, Dr. Bradley got it. This is a Takatsubo's patient. So really quickly, B and Kratner were 22 and 1.0. CBC was normal. Trope was 1.1. Normal coags. Um, chest x-ray, she was mildly congested, so she did have a little bit of heart failure. BNP was 760. Um, so calf, echo, both. Observe overnight, rule her out for an infarct, and take her to the cath lab tomorrow. We, we did one and two. Um, so since I'm an echo person, I'm going to show the echo images. And I thought variation on a theme because I actually wanted to show the obstructive ED. Uh, so she has no prior history of HCM. She has no prior history of any cardiac issues and no prior history of a heart murmur. So this is an apical long axis view, for those of you who don't read echoes. Um, Matt, do you want to comment, or should I sure. think we have enough time? So in systole, the mitral valve uh, kisses the septum, so there's left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And the, um, the LV dimensions are not measured, but it doesn't look like they're metric left ventricular hypertrophy. No. Uh, picture and then the base is hyperconvectile. Uh, we don't see all of the impacts, but we think it's a stress cardiomyopathy. The impacts doesn't seem to be seen as well. And then this is the color flow of that outflow tract, and there is there is a gradient here. There you go. There's your apex. So the apex is uh, hypokinetic, and the base is hy somewhat hyperdynamic. Um, that you can see that the, the mitral valve portal tissues are headed towards where the septum is during systole. And that's a lot of MR. Severe. <laughs> Variation on a theme. So. That's, it's not totally posteriorly directed in that picture either. So. No. And I'll show you why in a few minutes, too. So again, a little bit of my, she actually does have a little bit of mitral valve prolapse that was not, unknown to her um, until we did this workup. And yeah, I was just really impressed by that anterior motion of that, the systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet. So she did undergo an angiogram about the same time, a little bit 
after that echocardiogram. Again, she was chest pain-free. She, of course, as expected, had completely normal coronaries. This was classic Takatsubos. Um, continued to have some chest pain, shortness of breath, and a significant murmur, and she remained mildly short of breath. Um, so what do you do next? Uh, TEE, um, MRI. Keep in mind, this was not a Minneapolis Heart Institute patient. Um, and then a surgical consult for mitral valve surgery. Well, one question I'd have is, has she ever had an echo before, and what was the degree of mitral regurgitation before? She'd never had one. She hadn't been seen by us and was really, really healthy, but her primary notes going back demonstrated no evidence of, a, of any murmur. So the posterior prolapse makes it more complicated. If it were all just related to stress cardiomyopathy, you would hope that as her stress resolved, the dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction would also resolve and that the mitral regurgitation would likely not be as severe. So one option is just to uh, manage her subacutely and, and follow up and see how her mitral regurgitation is doing. With the posterior prolapse, you could think about doing a TE um, to further look at the valve. And so the, the, the physicians who were taking care of her at the time are really, really concerned about her um, uh, valve. And so they actually did proceed with a TEE. And so this is a transgastric um, view of the apex. That isn't going to play. Yeah, there it is. Um, and it does show that, that that degree of hypokinesis, this I think was day two or day three through the course, had actually started to improve. There's the mitral valve prolapse. This is on no presser support, just on uh, routine heart failure medicine. Blood pressure was um, normal during this time. A little less impressive there. The degree of um, systolic anterior motion has lessened already. Prolapse, posterior leaflet primarily. That's the this real view of the mitral regurg and the long axis. A lot less, as, as is often the case in TEE, a lot less mitral regurgitation. But this is already about 48 hours into her presentation for Takatsubos. And so her mitral regurgitation had improved. So she was medically managed, um, diaries very gently just for her crackles and her little bit of heart failure. Started on Coreg and Lysinopril. It was felt her outflow tract obstruction was just as Dr. Chu had pointed out due to her mitral valve prolapse, which was underlying and undiagnosed, with very hyperdynamic basal segments. She actually clinically did very well and had a follow-up echo a couple months later. That's that same personal long axis uh, picture at the level of the outflow tract. And as you can see, just maybe a hair of cortal movement into the outflow tract, but really unremarkable compared to how she was. Her LV, so there's the apex there, her LV all but normalized. She did have, the official read was this, on this was mild to moderate mitral regurgitation, um, and she's clinically being followed for her MR secondary to her prolapse. But all of her clinical sy symptoms improved. Her functional tolerance was really good. And so I thought variation on a theme. I had one dynamic mitral regurgitation case I would show a second. And I, I went up and looked up dynamic mitral regurgitation in Takatsubos, because I, I don't know, I see a lot of Takatsubos, I don't often think about the mitral valve. But it turns out that both mitral regurgitation and systolic anterior motion are found in Takatsubos. Small studies demonstrate about 25% of patients with Takatsubos have acute mitral regurgitation, and approximately one-fifth of them have severe acute mitral regurgitation. Despite the favorable outcome, the associated presence of significant acute mitral regurgitation increases the risk of acute deterioration as well as adverse outcome in patients. And the recommendation, as, as Dr. Um, Chu so, so nicely, eloquently put it, is to medically manage it. But there are case reports of patients having to undergo surgery or potentially structural um, uh, intervention um, if they don't improve or if they have a very uh, significant or severe deteriorated course. So there's two different mechanisms that thought to lead to this dynamic acute MR in these patients. SAM is actually one of the mechanisms. I just thought it was going to be most of them, but it's only 50% of the patients have SAM. And it's one of the predictors of acute MR in patients. And again, it's for that same reason that as the apex becomes hypokinetic, the base becomes severely hyperkinetic, causing 
um, turbulent flow and pulling that systolic anterior, that systolic leaflet in, the anterior motion in during systole. And then the other interesting thing is they actually get mitral valve tenting. So you get tenting similar to what you see in ischemic mitral regurgitation by tethering of the papillary muscle and displacement due to the regional or global LD function. The patients who have um, tenting as the cause of their MR have a higher degree of wall motion abnormalities and the end systolic volume also is, is larger um, than patients who have MR due to SAM. And then again, as the Takotsubo is resolved, there's a simultaneous improvement of the mitral valve tethering. So you actually see the tenting improve and um, the severity. Now, I haven't seen a patient with tenting in Takotsubo's, but I like to show pictures. And so here's my picture of this is how they measure the tenting area and then the displacement um, apically of the valve that leads to the regurgitation. So again, variation on the team. And I do not think we're probably going to have time for our not a five-minute case, six minutes. Does anybody want to say anything about this case real quick, or should we try to plow through the third case? Maybe. All right. We won't ask. We'll just tell then. So 75-year-old woman with a history of practice on atrial fibrillation, status post-ablation. She's on flecainide and rivaroxaban. She was admitted to Cuyuna with a right middle lobe pneumonia. She was admitted feeling poorly for six days, nausea, cough, shortness of breath, chest tightness, no prior cough, no weight loss, no B symptoms. She was really, really healthy until six days prior to admission. In fact, she was walking two miles on a daily basis, had done so actually up to two days prior to admission. She was seen in her primary care clinic with chest x-ray concerning for pneumonia, started on doxycycline and um, on dasterone, and uh, started vomiting. And so because of the vomiting, dizziness, and weakness, she presented to the Cuyuna ER, she got one liter of fluids, some ceftriaxone, azithromycin, and was admitted to the hospital. She then started having worsening lightheadedness and dizziness, and on the morning of her admission had an episode of syncope. Her blood pressure prior to the syncope was 130, and it dropped to 94 over 30, and she did vomit. Her uh, river roxapan was given at 5 p.m. the night before, and then she proceeded to vomit. This is the chest x-ray from the outpatient. I don't know about you guys. I was terribly unimpressed. But this is what they're calling her pneumonia, the right middle lobe pneumonia. But otherwise, no fluid, not very exciting. So past cardiac history, she did have normal coronaries back in 2008 by CT. Pulmonary vein isolation in 2015. Hypertension, goiter, cellulitis. Her medication, she's normally on flecainide, uh, the Rivoxaban, Ranolactone for her blood pressure. Um, Eprazole, doxycycline. Um, she's allergic to lisinopril, uh, sulfa, and amitriptyline. Her physical exam, when I met her, her blood pressure was 122 over 70. She was not tachycardic. Her heart rate was 77. Um, she did have labored breathing. She had a slight elevation in her jugular venous pulsation, but no coup smalls. Uh, no, uh, she did have a murmur, but no gallops or rubs. Um, her abdominal exam was soft. She had trace edema. Other than just looking like she was working a little hard to breathe, nothing terribly exciting. Labs, um, her sodium was 125. Her chloride and uh, bicarbonate were 89 and 22, the potassium of 4.7. Her admission, so this was the day prior to me meeting her, creatinine was 1.28. Her creatinine when I saw her was 1.71. Troponin was 0.23, BNP is 195, and her CBC, really unremarkable. Her white count was only 10.1. EKG, also for the interest of time, sinus rhythm, not really specific for anything terribly exciting. Please stop me if you guys think you see anything more interesting. And that was her echo. Um, this is a peristernal long axis view. LV function is preserved. Really nice invagination of the right ventricle. This is an echo board question. But you can see that that heart is swinging. This is an apical four chamber, really large pericardial effusion. Again, had been perfectly fine walking up until 48 hours before she got her antibiotics and everything else. No fevers, no chills, we just keep going. So she did, I'm assuming you guys would all send her for a pericardiocentesis. She went ahead and had a pericardiocentesis from the apical approach, um, had a pigtail secured. Her pericardial pressure 
was 27 millimeters of mercury upon opening, but that was impressive. 466 cc's of serosanguinous fluid was removed and sent for the usual stuff. Later that night, she had an increase in chest pain um, from 4 out of 10 to 9 out of 10 and dumped 250 cc's of fluid into the chest, into the pericardial centesis tube, kind of all of the sudden dramatically. We repeated a chest x-ray. She actually had an increase in her pleural effusions. The pericardial catheter was in place. Her echo didn't show anything um, exciting. And her vitals remained stable, although her oxygen saturations declined. So the following day, this is day two, um, so the next morning I come in and I get a call, hey, your cultures are already positive. So she grew out enterobacter orogenes from her pericardial effusion. And no, it was not a contaminant. And this grew rapidly and it grew in everything. And so has anybody seen enterobacter orogenes in a pericardial effusion? No, nobody has, by the way. I, I looked, I tried to find this. Um, so it's a gram-negative oxidase-negative catalase-positive uh, rod-shaped bacteria. Usually causes bacteremia and lower um, respiratory illnesses. It had some case reports of cellulitis, but it's a hospital-borne pathogen. It comes from us. You can see it after a wound infection, like an open mediastinum. Um, patients are usually quite ill. They're incredibly toxic. It's known to cause SIRS and a septic inflammatory response. There's one case report of endocarditis, but no case reports of pericarditis. I, I looked. I couldn't find anything. So she was started on levofloxacin. The hypothesis from ID was that right middle lobe of pneumonia, and again, I was terribly unimpressed with that right middle lobe pneumonia, but that right middle lobe, lobe pneumonia seeded the pericardium, which left, led to the pericardial effusion. How do you get an enterobacter erogenes right middle lobe pneumonia? And they thought perhaps she aspirated, and that led to the pneumonia. She was placed on a 14-day course of cefepime. Due to the history of PVA and her ongoing chest pain, we got an MRI. Her pulmonary veins were perfectly fine. Her pericardium, I'm going quickly, sorry, showed this really impressive um, enhancement, really inflamed pericardium. She was on colchicine from the moment I met her. As soon as her renal function improved for her chest pain, we put her on ibuprofen. That chest tube drained for about four to five days, so it kept draining fluid for four to five days. Her pathology returned two days later, and not only did she have enterobacter erogenes in that pericardial fluid, she actually had metastatic adenocarcinoma. Yeah, and her, yes? So I Based on the size of the pericardial effusion, it was huge, and um, her presentation was kind of, she was walking, I mean, that must be something that developed over a longer time than a day or two, so I don't know, maybe she had it in the pneumonia, I mean, it's just tough to think that she just had pneumonia and acute effusion and walked in, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I pressed her, because when I, because I had met her, um, so the curbside individual had actually seen the echo and had accepted her for pericardiosynthesis. So I met her in the ICU. And so, of course, my history was goal-directed. I was looking. I was looking for rashes, rheumatoid arthritis. I, right, but she'd had no symptoms for the cancer. She had no B symptoms, nothing Oh, no, no. I'm not yeah. saying that you would have picked up. I'm yeah. just saying now, in retrospect. Retrospect. She had no yeah. absolute, you know, yeah. nothing that could have been done differently. Yeah. But probably she had the cancer and the effusion going on, and it just got infected and grew or something. Yeah, and that was the hypothesis that she'd had the pericardial effusion from the non-small cell carcinoma. Her, her cancer, she'd had no idea she'd had cancer. She'd actually been not losing weight, really no symptoms at all, and she was widely metastatic at the time of presentation. I wanted to show she had 10 different um, brain lesions um, when she was found, and then she had bone mets, skeletal mets, um, and lymph node mets throughout her chest cavity as well. Um, so I, I too, had that same thought as, like, she probably had the effusion and then managed to seed it with the right middle lobe pneumonia. It's actually very, very rare bacterial endocarditis, um, or, sorry, bacterial pericarditis. Usually it's pneumococcus, streptococcus, and cephalo cephalococcus. The mortality is quite high without tamponade, and then, of course, with tamponade, it's high. And then, as Dr. Abdelhadi pointed out, it's usually not seen in a healthy host. The majority of cases are in HIV-positive patients or patients who have alcohol abuse and then um, immunosuppressed hosts. So, again, the thought was that likely 
it was there the effusion and then rapidly grew after she seeded with the aspiration pneumonia and then up up until six days before she had no symptoms she was doing really well so I, I have not seen both a malignant and bacterial pericardial effusion so I thought it was a good fast show and tell and that's it thank you any other questions thank you very much everybody have a great week thank Amen. you very much for all of you who interacted thank you Thank <laughs> you.